I think it was Dorothy Sayers who said something to the effect that there was no wobbly table that ever came out of that workshop, that carpentry shop in Nazareth. Think about that. Why was that the case? Because in that workshop, that carpentry shop in Nazareth, Joseph and his foster son knew what they were about. And they knew that their work with the material world was touching upon the vocation, the very reason that Christ came and the way in which he came to the world. That is, to redeem the world from within the world. Any of you who have ever been around the Acton Institute for any length of time at all have heard me or my colleagues reflect over and over again uh, on the insight of the philosopher Etienne Dilson, who said that piety is never a substitute for technique, because the only way in which we can be servants of God is by pursuing the excellence in what we do. That our piety is not disembodied. Our piety must be instantiated. It must be like Christ incarnated into our world if we're going to make use of nature for the glory of God. Most of us in this room take this kind of approach to business and to economics as a given, that we have to incarnate who we are and what our vocation is in the workaday world. Yet, how often have you heard people, even religious people, even religious leaders, question in one way or another the moral status of enterprise, the process of buying and selling, out of a fear that somehow commerce is beneath morality, it's beneath human dignity, that to sell products, the products of one's labor, to use the Marxist phrase, is unjust and exploitative. I really wish I had a dime. I would never have to send out another fundraising letter again. If, I, if, I, if just a dime for every time I've heard or have been confronted at a lecture with the question, well, don't you know that it's easier for a camel to pass through, you right? Through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God? Somehow there's a radical disconnect in the minds of many people between serving God and making and the engagement in market processes. Just take this passage that I just alluded to the eye of the needle, the camel and the eye of the needle, which is to be found in both Mark and Matthew's Gospels. Even in those texts, so superficially familiar to so many who see it as solely a denunciation of market processes, how many people fail to see that before that rich young man is instructed by our Lord to generously distribute his wealth to others, Jesus first gives him the command to go and sell all that he has. Now think about that for a moment. Just let that sink in because it's something that people don't get. Jesus first tells him to sell what he has and then to distribute the proceeds of that sale. Now, remember, he's going to distribute those proceeds of the sale to do what? In some way or another, to alleviate the dis-ease in people's lives. In some way or another, to bring comfort to people's lives. In some way or another, to enrich, pardon the expression, people's lives. He was to benefit the poor. One would presume that he wanted to get a good price on his possessions in order to better benefit the poor, right? 
So the point is that profit makes generosity possible. And the greater the profit, the greater the possible generosity. And as to the ownership of the possession of things as such, surely there is a world of difference between the one who holds things simply as possessions and the one who holds things as an opportunity for service. The former sees himself as the Lord and Master of what he possesses, whereas the latter sees himself as a servant and a steward. This is precisely the corrective that the Acton Institute has been offering to free market institutions for these past 28 years by promoting the idea that enterprise does not simply exist for the sake of producing profits, but for the purpose of service. That it is a manner in which we can use technique to benefit others, to serve God. The purpose being to unfold the deeper significance of work, of respecting the concrete reality of the world in which people spend so much of their times and helping them to understand that that concrete mundane reality has a significance beyond time. That is to say that this mundane existence whereby people earn sufficient resources to support their families actually fulfills a vocation that God has given to the whole human race to be creative as God was creative. This is the kind of work that begets work, as the phrase goes. This is the kind of work that has dignity and an eternal significance. Only once we have a clear understanding of who we are as human beings, as human persons, can we realize that our authentic needs and our aspirations entail something much, much larger than the material, which in turn enables us to integrate these legitimate material needs into a more comprehensive and richer view of human life and who we are before Almighty God. Economics at its most fundamental level is not essentially about money. It's about human action, human evaluation. How we answer the big questions, who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What is man? These big questions have an enormous impact on every facet of our lives, including how we work, how we buy, and how we sell. And how we believe such activities ought to be directed on economics and in every aspect of our lives. At the beginning, when God made us, when God made the human family, we were placed in the context of a material world, which is to say we were placed in the context of scarcity, which is to say that is where economics arises from. Because what's economics? It's the determination of what you do with scarce resources. Our survival from that moment of creation right to the present, has depended upon a process of discovery of the best use of things to sustain our existence. In an economic vocabulary, like that of Professor Israel Kirzner, this discovery process is called entrepreneurship. It may also be seen 
I like to think in the search for excellence. But the problem with the search for excellence is that it so simply can devolve into a quest for merely the efficient. Now, efficiency is important, but it's not the definition of who we are. It's not the meaning of our lives. And then when we take it that way, this fails to take into consideration the whole of who human beings are in their totality. After all, economics or the truths of economics are true, but they're not the whole truth of who human beings are. Because you and I transcend our physicality. We pursue things like love and honor and beauty. And that is a proof of our transcendence, that we're made for more, that eternity is inscribed in our hearts. In fact, any search for excellence is really an inchoate search for God because it is a search for the truth. Now, it's understandable that the human race has been preoccupied with survival all these years until really about 200 years ago when we hit the lotto. Jonah Goldberg has just written a very interesting book on the subject called The Suicide of the West. And he makes a very cogent observation. He says that for most of human history, the preoccupation was how do we survive? But slowly, inexorably, a shift is taking place. Because now we have to go to the question of not how do we survive, but how do we live with prosperity? And that question is a moral question. And that question is a question that the Acton Institute is well equipped to address. My friends, we cannot shrink from the task that falls to us now at this moment in human history, perhaps more than at every, any other moment which is to articulate a new and refreshed articulation of the, to a new generation, a new generation that does not remember what totalitarianism really looked like, that does not recall the divisions of Europe, and a generation that does not read deeply. This is the task that we have before us. How do we inform, and in what language, with what idiom do we inform this new generation of these eternal truths, these verities without which civilization itself will not survive? My friends, we must defend with vigor the pillars of civilization, which simply require ordered liberty, limited government, and the freedom of human beings to find and fulfill their destiny. This is what you support when you support the Acton Institute. This is what we believe because we believe in human dignity, and we seek to build a civilization worthy of the human person. Thank you very much for your attendance this evening.